So kind of goes along with the theme of our debate team this year. But I, it was just, I don't know, it, something about it uh, captivated me. Just, I think the, the poetic way it says it. Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee? So obviously it's a rhetorical question. Haven't I, um, haven't I done this? You know, so it's rhetorical in the sense, not that it shouldn't be answered, but rather that it's the kind of question that highlights what's going on here. The kind of question that highlights what happened. Okay. There it goes. All right. It's the kind of question that not only highlights it, but then it says, isn't this excellent? One of the things I like about Proverbs is um, that it is a lifetime of notebooking. So apparently, Solomon was one of these guys that would take a notebook around with him. And when, especially when he was consulting the wise men, and he says this in, in, in spots in the Proverbs, he says, you know, I um, consulted the wise men, I listened to what they said, and he would jot down. And he kept a collection of wise sayings. He loved turns of phrases. He loved um, quippy sayings, not just like surface level um, cheap stuff, but things that were quippy but deep, right? That had that were eye catching and deep at the same time. And as he would talk about this, you know, he wants to share. He's he's kept, he's collecting it not for himself partly, but also to be able to share it. He's like, this is valuable stuff. You know, there weren't that many people who could read and write in that in those days. Um, I guess theoretically, some people believe that that was the Levite's job was to teach um, the young kids at least to read. Um, and that's why the, the Levites were scattered through all the tribes of Israel um, so that they could, um, you know, and, and they usually had service kinds of work, um, community service type of work, right? They didn't own large swaths of property. They weren't, they weren't landholders by the, for the majority of the time. They received you know, a tithe of the rest of the nation. And so they were kind of this um, priestly class supported by the nation in order to devote time to, you know, obviously worship, but also to these other things like teaching to read, what, teaching the law, which included teaching to read. And um, then, you know, some rudimentary medical is what some people believe. You know that they they had a knowledge of diseases and they could identify them and and you know help help people. So anyway, I said all that to say um, I guess that there was a rudimentary uh, literacy in Israel, unlike many other places um, in the world, and. But at the same time, Solomon felt like some of this stuff was so valuable, it should be shared. It should be shared in, in a broader sense. And so he would collect notebooks of wisdom, wise sayings. And that's what you have with the book of Proverbs. Although um, in its present modern form, it wasn't exactly like that in, in, in uh, Solomon's day. 
it was and possibly longer, possibly shorter. And we know that the last five chapters of the book uh, is, in fact, it tells us after chapter 25 that they were, that during Hezekiah's day, they had actually found some old notebooks that had been, quote unquote, lost or were no longer, um, you know, in circulation. And they added those last four chapters to the book of Proverbs. And so we know that it was edited at least at that point in Hezekiah's day and added to. And, you know, anyway, but Proverbs is one of my favorite books. Um, he's curious, right? He values knowledge. He values not just knowledge, not just bare facts, but also rhetoric, how to express knowledge in very poignant, picturesque ways, how to use language, how to use language excellently. And that's what he, he's drawing attention to here, right? Have not I written to the excellent things in counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee to know the certainty of the words of truth. So this isn't just, you know, so we have the, the ethos, right? It's excellent. We have the um, pathos. How should we feel about it? You know, it's it's beautiful. It's picturesque. It's rhetorical. And we have the logos. It's truth. It's factual. And so all, all the things that we think of as pure rhetoric um, are, are, these, are these documented expressions that Solomon has here for us, that you might answer. It's not just theoretical. And um, one of my favorite linguists, uh, my, one of my favorite communications experts, and you've probably heard me talk about him before, Stephen Toulman. He's the one who kind of wrote the book on argumentation in the 1960s. Um, he says it's not not good philosophy if it's not good praxis right um he um he said people during the 1800 the 1800s and early part of the 1900s philosophy is getting more and more abstract more and more but what we think of as philosophical more and more um detached and he says we're going in the wrong direction it's not praxis, it's not philosophy unless it's praxis, unless it's, it actually applies to your life, to your way of acting and doing and thinking. That thou mightest answer, so you can have an answer, so you can have knowledge and you can apply it in, in, a, in, a, in a day by day way. The words of truth to them that send unto thee. Um, so, in a sense, the lesson that we're looking at today in chapter six is exactly this. It's um, this understanding your role within a company and how that role is defined in, in different ways with different relationships. So the dynamics of different relationships. Um, and so those relationships in a sense, they frame how you are going to react, but they don't necessarily dictate how you're going to react. What should dictate how you react is your own sense of values and your own ethics and your own um, skills and abilities. And being and, and knowing what your skills and abilities are. And understanding what your role is, what your um, what piece of the puzzle that you supply is. I like to use the word gifts. No, understanding what your gift is makes you fit into the larger whole. Um, let me use since we're using uh, talking about organizational um, structure. Let me use. Um, the organization of a church uh, as an example, and y'all may y'all may recognize this. 
jump over back to ESV. Um, I like the old way of writing um, the, that the King James has sometimes. It's very picturesque, very poetic. All right. Um, we're going to go to first Corinthians 12. We'll probably hit Romans 12 as well. Okay, spiritual gifts. It says, I don't want you to be uninformed. Um, and here he, he goes. So he's trying to show the, the key word that we used last week, last um, session was symphony, right? The um, harmony within diversity. And I love that word, some, the heart. And so this is, this is the picture that um, is used to represent how the church should function. Um, Apologies. I'm trying to log into an account here real quick. Can't find it. Usually when you're in a hurry that you can't find anything that you're looking for. All right. All right. So the idea here is that the church is one organization. You could even use the word organism. The church is an organism. It's like a body. And that's the kind of the picture that he uses. Um, oh, uh, in another place. I'll, I'll get there in just a second. It says there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit there are a variety of service with the same lord there are a variety of activities but it's the same god who empowers them all, all in everyone to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good for to one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit to another the faith by the same spirit to another the gifts of healing miracles to another the prophecy to another the ability, the ability to distinguish between spirits another various kinds of tongues and other interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each individually as he wills. Just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Body doesn't consist of only one body, of a member, or all I, that would be a monstrosity. The foot shouldn't say because a hand, um, that wouldn't 
make it any less a part of the body. Or the ear shouldn't say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It would not make it any less part of the body. The whole body where an eye where would be the sense of hearing. The whole body where an ear where would be the sense of But it is God arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body many parts, but one body? And then he gives a warning, right? The eye shouldn't say or cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I don't need you. What would the head do without feet, right? It would roll on the ground. It couldn't be anywhere. You need feet to take, take you. Um, what would the eye do without the hand, right? It wouldn't, you know, you, you need a hand to rub, rub the sleep out of your eyes. Otherwise, you're not going to be seeing for very long. Um, so, I use this illustration um, in, the, in the context of role, in the context of leadership, in an organization because it's important for each of us to to do a personal inventory know what our gift is know what our role is and then our role gives us authority i like to use the word authority if you want to use a different word we can use the word influence our role gives us influence and this is true in our administration. This is true in whatever uh, company that you go into. Your, your abilities give you influence. They give you, even in a sense, they give you um, dominion. Right? They give you um, authority in the sense of you have, you can dictate within the parameters of your role. All right, so many organizations have hierarchical structures. That's part of the order of the universe, right? There are there are, there are ranks, there are orders. Some people get, you know, some people are over other people. Some people get paid more than other people, but each one is essential within the workings of the whole. And there has to be communication up the ladder as well as down the ladder. Okay, there has to be listening and respect up the ladder as well as down the ladder. There has to be, um, there has to be communication down Toward those below you, and there has to be communication up toward those above you. And I use the word below and above in a very narrow sense, all right? Not in the sense of worth, not in the sense of actual um, value, but simply in the sense of the order of the structure, the order of the organization. Um, another one of the verses um, in this context that I wanted to use is, and we're, we're going to get to the textbook, but I, I think you'll see that all these tie in very nicely with the textbook. Um, Ephesians 5. And I know this is a, a, a touchy subject. I'm going to give you my opinion. Um, you're free to disagree with me on this. Um, so, so I, I guess, um, our, us and our family, we hold um, what is called a complex husband wife relationship. In other words, um, there's an order. To the husband, the wife. Um, that doesn't make the wife less than the husband. 
um, and it doesn't make the husband and wife. And it is, again, like I said, it is a very narrow organizational sense. There are people who would like to use this, and, and this is this is my um, this is my explanation from a, a gendered perspective. There are people who want who want to use this and say all women should submit to all men, and that's not um, what the text says. I don't believe. Um, there is um, in this sense it says is uh, uh, for the woman to submit to the husband um, in a, like I said, a very narrow organizational sense. This is a voluntary choice, right? It's not the husband's role or anyone else's role in any anywhere in society to make her submit, right? And if we were to look at this context, we see that submitting comes before before wives, um, husbands are also to submit. Submit to one another. One another. This is a relational thing, right? So what does that mean? I submit today on Thursdays, and then you submit on Fridays. Um, you know, do we take turns submitting? Um, and this is where your understanding of your role comes in. Um, like I, like we read before, does the head submit to the foot or does the foot submit to the head? All right. If we think it's not, uh, uh, it's not a binary, it's not an antagonism, right? One against the other. It's not the, the, the head duking it out against the feet. No, you're one organism. If y'all don't learn, figure out a way to work together. None of yours going anywhere, right? Without the head telling the feet where to go, um, he wouldn't know. Without the feet um, carrying the head, the head wouldn't get anywhere. And I, I know that's a very crude example. I, I apologize. But my point is, submitting one to another, husbands have to learn where and in what context and under what circumstances they are to submit to their wives. Okay? Now, now, going back to the church, let's use an example. So there are in, in some church structures, and, and this is widely for various, you know, from one church to the next. In some church structures, the bishop or the pastor kind of has a leading role, right? We would call him the CEO of an organization in, in, in a series of hierarchies, right? Um, and then you have other people. Let's let's use one example, a deacon. All right. In Baptist churches, we have a deacon who serves, um, usually administers um, monies and properties and things like that. OK. The, the bishop comes to the deacon and says, you know, um, God told me you got to do this. Um, all right. Do you use something a little more concrete? God says we need to build a, a half a million dollar building. Um, now, that's fine. He's got this vision. He sees a project. It needs to be happened. He can say, you know, as the, 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 the um, member of the body that's called the mouth, the bishop has that role to, to give a vision, to speak, to say this is what should happen. But then the bishop has to submit to the deacon in the sense that the deacon knows what's actually in the treasury. It's like, you know, that's a great vision, but we don't have a half a million in the treasury. We don't even have a tenth of that to make a down payment on a half a million dollar loan. Right. So the bishop, the you know, the, the church kind of submits to the bishop in, in leadership. He says, I think this is the direction we need to go. I think this is what we need to do. But then the bishop also has to submit. You know, he can't build it by himself. He can't raise the funds by himself. If, if people don't buy into the vision, if they don't agree that what he's saying is actually true, 
they're not going anywhere. So the bishop also has to submit to the deacon, right? And, and, and so you see how the dynamics, and I use these examples because these are the examples I'm most familiar with. I've worked in um, church administration, you know, for 15, 20 years. Um, so the roles shouldn't be a, a case where it, it, it shouldn't give us um, to, to look down on ourselves or to depreciate ourselves. In fact, our roles should, should elevate each of you. You know, when you understand what your gift is and say, hey, within my gift, I am king in this domain, right? Within what I do. So if we were to go back to the one that we were just looking at in, in Corinthians 12, right? Um, one of the examples they use here was speaking in tongues and interpreting in tongues, right? Uh, or languages, right? In a very linguistic sense, right? If if someone comes to the church in Macedonia from Asia, you know, are they going to speak Latin or are they going to speak Greek? Um, if they come from Judea and he, Jerusalem, everybody wants to hear. Now he's he is the bishop from the from the biggest from the oldest church there, and he comes to Macedonia, but they can't understand him because he's speaking Aramaic. Okay, he has to submit to a translator. You know, he can't do it all himself. The the translator within his role as a translator, uh, as a skilled person in both languages, he's got free reign to express these wonderful words that James is saying in the Greek tongue so that the Macedonians will understand it. And the same, we can use other examples, right? The person who um, gives, they have the gift of giving. Or the person who shows mercy, the gift of, of mercies, you know, like um, they are good at taking care of people. Um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, the gift of, of knowledge, the gift of wisdom. So each person understanding their role gives um, them incredible freedom to be themselves, to execute that, that role, to do what they can do. And, and um, within that, they can exercise their influence, their leadership, their, um, their dominion, their authority, right? So authority is shared. One person can't have all authority. You know, the Romans couldn't stand a, a one person. Have, I, I'm a Latin teacher, so I, I do a lot of Roman history. And they couldn't stand one person to have authority. That's why in the Senate, they always elected two consuls, right? One person isn't going to ro rule everything. We have these systems of checks and balances in organizations because one person can't do everything. They're even in vice president structure, right? You've got a vice president of finance. You've got a vice president of marketing. You've got a vice president of, um, of leadership. You've got a vice president of, uh, let's, let's look at some uh, organizational structures. Let's do a different organization. Let's do um, hospital organizational hierarchy. So how many people are in a hospital? 
right? This is a Pinterest picture, so it's going to be really small and un unseeable. Let's try this one. You got the executive director, the board of directors, another subsidiary director, an IT site manager, medical director, finance director, marketing director, general services director, dining director, resident life director, human resources director, and director of continuing care. Right. And then they have other management plate positions under them. Right. Every one of them is essential. Every one of them within their domain um, take ownership of that aspect of the of the job that needs to get done. They are qualified. They are um, influential. They are functioning. If the executive director, you know, how could he possibly? attends to all the pieces of paper that are produced by all these people by himself. He can't. He has to rely on each one of them doing their part, and he has to listen to them as they give him recommendations and, and feel some kind of confidence that they are actually going to be able to... Um, I'm sorry. Y'all can't see what I'm looking at. I apologize. Okay, let me pull it over here. You see that now? We can see it now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so you got the executive director, board of directors, IT site manager, you know, all these positions. The executive director has to listen, has to submit to these other people and their recommendations because he wasn't down there, you know, on the third floor to see what the needs of those um, patients were, right? He wasn't down in the dining room to see what the food needs of the hospital were. He wasn't in the, the room, you know, the resident life director to see how many rooms are needed. You know, when you get, whenever COVID hits and you get maxed out and you have no more, more rooms, or at least you don't have rooms that have the proper protocol to protect everyone from COVID, then he has to submit to their reports, to their um, ideas, to, what is actually ha happening on the ground, you know, so submission goes both ways is my point, right? Submission goes both ways and clear, clear communication also goes both ways. And that's the point that we're uh, trying to come to today is clear communication. All right, so in chapter six, We're going to explore relationship types at work, superior and subordinate relationships, communicating information, semantic information, distance, uh, and upward distortion. Exploring relationship types at work. Messages are altered in four ways. Um, so starting back with the idea of symphony, 
Now let's talk of one of the principles here in um, interpersonal communication. And this is where culture, um, okay, I'm gonna use the, the expression that my wife loves. Um, I, I've got a book on my shelf. Uh, it's an anthropology book on communication. And she, she loved the idea. It's called dialogical, dialogical emergence of culture. Um, hopefully the, the, I know that's a mouthful, those three concepts, but if you put those three concepts together, what is it? Culture emerges. And, and I think, he, I think y'all would, um, culture, we have talked about it is this thing, this atmosphere, these ideas, these values around us. But culture doesn't, doesn't remain static, right? Culture is constantly developing. And it's developing in a direction. It's developing in a trajectory or a trend. We can see um, the trends in society, right? That we can see the trends in our culture. And that's the idea of emerging, right? They come and, and they emerge. Why? They emerge. The emergence is from a variety of influences, right? Each of you in your roles and gifts have influence, right? How are you going to use your influence? You have influence. How are you going to use it? Are you going to use it effectively? And how do we use it effectively? Through dialogue. Through dialogue. All right, so that's, in a nutshell, that's what this chapter is about. And so I want to kind of unpack it with you a little bit here. So we're exploring these relationships. And of course, they, they because so many um, organizations have a hierarchical um, structure, the uh, superior subordinate relationship is one of the main focuses of this of this chapter. But. Um, Influence, it, uh, where it was, here it is. Influence is like um, magnetism, right? It's energy. It's electrical energy. It's a, on the electromagnetic spectrum, right? And what happens when two magnets come together, they, they start exerting force on each other, right? It's not just one. I mean, obviously, the size of one can then can alter the other, but even a small, even a small magnet can exert influence on a larger magnet and actually affect their properties. That's why we know um, how, uh, you know, that's why we know about the revolution of bodies in space is because of this principle of magnetism. Um, we know the, the planets that existed, right? And then uh, Uranus and Pluto were discovered and he, they've even since discovered another, um, another dwarf planet past Pluto. Why? Because they could see an, an aberration in the revolution exerted on it, even though it was small, the magnetic um, influence of it changed the properties of the things that it came in contact with. And in the same way, you are going to 
just by you being in this relationship, you're going to change the dynamics of the relationship, right? And hopefully this culture is going to emerge in a positive, in a helpful structure, right? In a helpful relationship. So, there's an upward distortion, right? That magnetism is going to shift. It, 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 well, the distortion is both directions. They, they're using the word upward here. But the, the, the distortion goes both directions, right? It goes upward and downward. And like I said, um, if you're smart, smart people are going to learn to um, are going to learn to submit appropriately. Um, know when to speak up, know when to shut up, right? Know what is your business and what isn't your business. That's that's a, a huge um, factor in communication. What is your business? What do you have a say in? Um, and once you understand what you have a say in, have your say, right? Don't let other people downplay your position, downplay um, your role. You know, if they give you something to do, but they don't give you the, the, the kind of support that it takes to accomplish that, that's not a good organization. I've, I've worked in organizations like that, right? They send you out to do, um, okay, so I did a mission in Mexico for six months. Um, I was sent, you know, they sent me a meager living. Um, and they want, and they had this huge blitz that they wanted to happen in and around Mexico City. Somewhere upwards of a million um, advertisements were made. And I was supposed to uh, figure out some kind of follow-up. I was supposed to take the, the mailed-in um, follow-up, um, create, you know, some kind of feedback. Uh, funnel the stuff, uh, the funnel the responses, you know, and the, the the leads into a an appropriate feedback loop. And uh, basically, I didn't have anything. I didn't have a computer. I didn't, uh, you know, all the things. You know, you you think you can spend enough money to produce a million advertisements. And with no infrastructure support, that's a tough place to be. And uh, I mean, obviously, I was young and I was um, dumb. <laughs> um, and I, would, I wouldn't hope that kind of uh, a situation on any of you. But understanding what your role is and what your goal is and what your gift is, um, don't be afraid to ask for what you need to accomplish your goal. Like if you're going to hire me and that's part of the negotiation, even going into the, your, your job, if you're going to hire me, you know, make sure that I have the stuff. Otherwise you can't expect me to, to produce what you're asking me to produce. If you don't ensure that I have the kind of support. So they have to submit to you in what you need, as well as you submit to them in what they're asking you to do. So there's this mutual support right there's this mutual submission submitting one to one to another the interpersonal communication is important for the following reasons your ability to relate with others um, it helps you form professional connections um, work to provide a supportive social system that will increase your job um, Success and satisfaction. So superior and subordinate relationships, communicating information, right? Do you have information that everyone else in the org organization needs? Or at least they 
okay, they don't need every detail that you have, right? That's your job. Your job is to take care of a lot of details so that no, so that the other people don't have to, right? But you need to at least let them know in a broad picture, right? This part is done and this is what you need to know from it, right? So that you have to have this sense of being able to um, pass on this message. All right, so we've kind of dealt with the, um, the up and down the ladder relationship. The other one is your coworker relationship. Your coworkers um, are very important. The people who you actually bump um, shoulders with day in and day out that share the same cubicle or share the same office. If y'all can get along, that that's awesome. You know, if you can. Um, if you can actually enjoy each other and go to lunch together and um, talk about things and have um, the same kinds of goals and have at least to some degree the same work ethic where you both are are willing to you know pitch in and and, and do what you need to do um, that makes the job go right so being able to see your co-workers, being able to respect them and respect what they have to do, you know, not annoy them. Um, some of y'all have worked in, in great in um, group relationships, right? Some of y'all worked as teams in a debate team, right? And you know what each person's strengths and weaknesses are. And so you play those strengths and weaknesses together in order to get the win. As you know, as we we had Omar and Diet uh, break in the last TIPDA tournament, which was awesome. Um, and so that being able to work together and understand and appreciate each other, appreciate each other, right? And um Submit to one another, right? When, you're, when your um, partner passes the sticky notes, you know, you remember to actually use them in your next speech. Those things are, are important. Um, and then the, you know, this is kind of where, where the money comes in, is you're able to keep um, your clients or your customers you're able you're able to represent the organization to your clients your customers and tell the story right you're able to step into that role you're able to play that um drama of what the organization is supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to be meeting um providing services or meeting needs of the customer the client and um it's your job to kind of speak for the cut for the company, right? Depending on what your role is, you may have to make commitments for the company. You're, you may have to tell the customer, yes, we can do this. We can deliver this. And you know, by yourself, there's no way you can get all, everything done that they ask for. If you're in um, a software company, right? The client says we need this kind of job, you know, well, it's going to take um, 10 or 12 um, coders, you know, working full time for eight weeks, 16 weeks in order to get that done. You are the spokesperson, right? They gave you authority. They said, if you can do this, this, this and this, then you can tell them, yes, we'll do this. So you're the spokes spokesperson. You are committing other people's time, other people's skills, right? So uh, knowing what those are, knowing what you can do and what you can't do, um, and being able to um, interact with the customer and tell them, um, no, sorry, that is not our skill set, right? 
we not we we don't make um high uh 4k graphic video games we only make these you know very simple um animations that go with our educational content and so knowing what you can do what you can accomplish what is um, your product and what isn't knowing where those lines are is important um being a being in the culture and understanding what the culture is and also having you know this is where translation comes in with the customer client relationships right you are translating the organizational culture into customer speak you know the customer doesn't know your culture they don't know your organization they don't know what you can and can't do and they probably don't want to all they want is a product and you have to be be able to say you know to do the translation can we produce this product can we deliver what they're asking and can we make that commitment and um you're you're translating that for the customer you're letting them know hey we've got it covered you can rest assured um we're gonna have a prototype to you in three weeks you can come and look at it you can tweak it at that point um you know um from there they can say no i don't like this part i do like this part we can we can change the overall design and then we can start production and, and start adding the the modules that that need to be there all right so that customer client relationship is vital it's a little bit different but it's also again the customer is submitting to you what um you know if y'all if based on what they think you can produce right if they're shopping for x you know they go to x store if they're shopping for y they go to y store they don't go to x and ask them if they have y well they can but usually the question the answer is going to be no right so there is they have to submit to what you're capable of and then you submit to what they want and y'all have to come to some kind of an agreement on where where that where that happy medium is going to be. All right. This um this book has a whole section towards the end actually of the book, and I, that I think is really important. And they're giving us a little preview here. Is um having healthy boundaries in our lives between professional and personal life healthy boundaries so that you um know when to turn it off right so in this day and age uh, a lot of people work have to work weekends okay that's fine if that's what it takes to make um to, to you know to take care of business work the weekends but even in that you need to know you know what time are you going to cut it off and not cut it back on again you know if it is your your phone if it's your email if it's text messages whatever you know after this point i'm not going to answer text messages i'll i'll check them in the morning and finish and finish whatever i need to finish um because at home you also have roles right you also have responsibilities you're submitting to your family as well in their needs um and so you have these overlapping cultural requirements and you have to be able to to know you know where they can over overlap a little bit healthily and where all right i mean even in, in school, you have to know what you can actually do. You know, when do you have to say no to your friends in order to do homework? And when do you have to say no to homework in order to spend a little bit of time with your friends, right? You got to do both to be healthy and um, happy. 
You got to do both. And being able to make those decisions, um, being realistic of what, about what you can accomplish, you know, don't stay too long at the game, but also don't stay too long on the homework so that, um, you know, it drives um, you into uh, an, an unhealthy balance or off balance, as the case may be. And so they also talk about um, having personal relationships with people at work, you know, particularly, um, you know, husbands, wives, uh, parents, children, things like that, working together. And this is, um, this is a, one of those things where you have to take it under advisement. I don't know if y'all remember looking when we were looking at the culture of Amazon the other day, they actually had a series of pictures of mother daughter working together on the assembly line, you know, in some of their um, fulfillment things they have. Um, I know at our school, we have like um, one person teaching at the high school and another person teaching at the elementary that are, you know, that are a couple. Um, we have, well, actually, we had a lot of, of couples there. The, the, um, headmaster himself, his wife, it was a, a kindergarten teacher. And then she did, you know, then she did, um, computer lab and different things. So there are ways in which relationships can cross those lines, but and even at that, within the relationship, y'all need to know when to close the door and say, all right, work stopped out there. This is this is us. This is our relationship. And it has nothing to do with what happens in work. I don't know, y'all y'all may have heard the really interesting story about um Kellyanne Conway, the um the uh the kind of the mastermind behind the Trump campaign. Well, her husband is a Democrat. You know, he can't stand Trump. He didn't vote for Trump. And yet, apparently, you know, and there's there's many times that the, uh, people would try to drag them in, you know, what do you think about this and what do you think about that? And somehow um, they figured out a way to make their relation, their personal relationship work and keep her job as Trump campaign manager apart from their their relationship at home, right? Another example, Dolly Parton. Um, you know this uh, superstar, this icon in music and you know and industry, and you know she built all this infrastructure to provide jobs for this whole area in Tennessee. And um, happily married for 50, what, two or three years now. And her husband has nothing to do with her music. He has, he, he refuses to go to any of her um, Emmys. I mean, he loves and supports her. But, you know, that scene, that um, stage presence, that stardom, he's no part of that. He's like, you know, that's you. That's not me. Um, I don't like it. I'm not comfortable with it but I love you and I'm going to support you. So being able to figure out, so there's no, my point is there's no one story that can define this relationship. It's a, it's a process. It's a dialogical process where there has to be good communication, you know, figuring things out, being open and honest with each other and, and, um, you know, knowing where these where these lines should be, negotiating the lines that that's a big part of it. A big part of a relationship isn't that oh, okay, boom, this is the line, and I'm not budging, right? Um, it's actually negotiating the lines. It's being able to say, hey, this is important to me. You know, work is important. Work is important to our family, right? We need a paycheck. 
but also relation our, our intimacy is also important and at some point the paycheck is going to come to an end and we still want that intimacy to be there right so being able to negotiate those lines and say all right you know maybe it's take turns right um all right this weekend i've got to work but next weekend i'm, I'm going to be off and i'm going to spend time with the family right or we're going to go to new orleans and 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 go to the mall and go to a fancy restaurant or whatever you know so figuring out how to draw those lines and how to um draw them in healthy ways negotiated ways taking into account each person's needs um talks about se sex sexual harassment and you know this has always been uh, an issue seems like there are certain people who don't know how to draw lines um and they're constantly bulldozing other people's lines and crossing those lines um into what is completely inappropriate and some people don't know how to speak up for themselves and say hey that's my line and you shouldn't cross it um i have an aunt who lives in um who worked in the city of houston for years um uh, you know her whole career well, she started out actually in a architecture firm as a secretary and i mean she's a like a superstar secretary she's a what you call it an executive administrative assistant and you know she worked with she she used to always tell stories you know she worked with these big shot guys who would try to run after you know the women in in his office but she was really firm about where her lines were and she said she got along with them fine because she spoke up for herself that's the line it's not going to be crossed and um you know she had this you know charisma this um this in this character about her that um this authority if you will within her role that says all right um i'm going to be able to function much better to accomplish these goals that you have for me if we know where these lines are and so she was able to to maintain that and work for some you know big big name guys she um i don't know if you know go to the grocery store and and buy cooking oil luana cooking oil well, she was married to the guy who started the luana company um and he was a, a multimillionaire from new york that came down to louisiana and opened the company there in opelousas so lines between professional and personal keeping those communication you know privacy that's important right who do you share what happens at home with do you talk about that with your co-workers do you talk about that with your boss do you talk about your boss to your to your um, significant other at home you know where do the lines of communication get drawn right does your family actually want to hear about work right so figuring these um figuring out these lines is is really important and privacy is golden really is professional etiquette learning what is appropriate what is politeness you know all all cultures have their their sets of norms of what is polite what is good etiquette All right, so our key
Our, our keys, again, is know yourself, evaluate the professional context, um, establish healthy lines of communication or communicative interaction, and then always be willing to step back and assess where are we at? How are we doing? Is it is it is it being successful? Is it not? Um, what can we do to change? What can we do to improve? And this is where I think that that last step, this, the step of stepping back and considering, is where we get the most lazy, unfortunately. And I'm talking about myself as much as anyone else. You know. We don't want to go to that extra step and say, all right, is it working? Don't wait till it all comes crashing down around your ears. You know, be able to step back and reflect and keep kind of a, a watch on the pulse to say, hey, this is, you know, we need, we need to take a, we need to take a look at this. Um, there's, this is important. Um, this is something that needs addressing early rather than later. And you can make small adjustments earlier, whereas it it it's bigger adjustments. Um, the longer you let things go, and those bigger adjustments cause more shift and unbalance and instability. So being being uh, honest with yourself and with others in your communication is key. All right, um, that's about all we have on on this chapter six. I'll get this video up for those who haven't got to see it. Um, I'm going to be sending out. A uh, randomly drawn three person teams. And y'all are going to self organize as if y'all are co workers, right? Um, however, among the three, no two people are going to have the same role, right? You're going to each define different roles within your team. Now, this is, this is like, you're going to create a fictitious organization with a fictitious project, and you're all going to have fictitious roles. Okay, you can template it off of a real of a real company, a real project. All right, if you want to, if y'all are already in an organization together, um, you can you can write that up as a, as a report. What actually happens? Um, so y'all are going to, we're going to, if you don't have any ideas, um, I can throw out some ideas and they're mostly going to be probably, um, software building type teams, because that's what I'm, I'm curious about and interested in and studying right now. Uh, but if you have good ideas, then run with them. You know, I'm always interested in in seeing, you know, the creative things that people come up with. Next week, we have uh, chapter seven and eight. Actually, just chapter seven, I apologize. Um, I did have a question. Okay. Uh, last night, we did get an email saying that there were assignments due on the 18th, and, and which ones were those? Okay, so I opened up any assignments that hadn't gotten finished and that had already closed. I just reopened them up and basically opened them up to the 18th. That's when that's the end of um, midterms before everybody goes home for Christmas. Um, and I also just put in in that assignment i put the um there's not any assignments and actually there's just the videos that basically the assignment is for no points but it's just watching the videos uh, if you if you were in class then hey, you're good if there's anything you want to go back and review the video there 
The PowerPoints are there. Um, next week, we have one meeting on Monday. That's seven. Uh, I mean, sorry, one content, one lecture is chapter seven. Um, on Wednesday of next week, um, it'll be more like a round table. We're going to do things and work on projects. And then the week of midterms, there's nothing. Um, there will be projects for you to work on, but there's no lecture. Yeah. Okay. And will the midterms be based on like the PowerPoints and the lessons? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. That was a good question. Are there any other questions? Um, I have a question for after class. We can talk about it um, whenever you turn off the recording. Okay. I can do that right now. <laughs>